это важный момент, да. Заворачивай правду. Вот сколько Канал мне нужен на канал. Канал. Спасибо, нет? Я так Новой дорогой
Это тоже часть меня, как бы часть моей жизни, знаешь? Просто вот как бы часть меня. Ну, ладно. Ну, вот наоборот, да? Ну, наоборот, да наоборот, и... Себя говорит. Once you actually get into medical school, you want to know some things that you can do to excel. And I have been absolutely blown away by Lecturio. Lecturio is a resource for medical students that includes high quality video lectures, practice exams, and even helpful articles that will prepare you for medical school and beyond. And these videos are to hit on high yield, important concepts that you're learning in class. And for some reason, after I watch that video, it makes sense. Not only videos, but a ton of those quiz questions. Quiz questions, question banks, those are gold in medical school. This is exactly Exactly what I want. I want a nice board style question, a QBank question, and then testing this knowledge regularly using resources like Luxurio makes for a pretty good workflow. Incredible resource. I can't recommend it enough. And the key is that it requires absolutely no note taking, no textbooks, no highlighters, no pens, no nothing. We've done quite a few podcasts in this series, but I think this is probably going to be one of the most important ones because of the sheer number of people that are affected by, by long COVID. So I'm delighted to have Ondine and, uh, and Vicky with me today. And uh, Ondine, if you could introduce yourself first of all and tell us uh, why you're here. Hi, my name is Ondine Sherwood. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Long COVID SOS, which is a campaign and advocacy group for people with long COVID, and we've been going for about a year. I, contact, I contracted, um, I assume it was COVID-19, at the end of March last year, obviously, well, at that time, could not get tested and um, failed to get better, thought I was better several times, but um, unfortunately, it kept coming back. And I think now, 16 months on, I do feel that I've, I'm really reaching the end of the tale, I hope. Mm -hmm, indeed. And, and, and Vicky, welcome. To tell us about yourself, please. Hi, I'm Vicky von der Klops. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, I got sick in March last year, and with all the symptoms uh, that we now know about, so I had the pneumonia, uh, tired all the time, I had really bad circulation issues, so I couldn't really walk for three months. Um, I had a lot of trouble walking, uh, and also neurological uh, symptoms. And I really didn't really hear anyone in the Netherlands talk about any persisting symptoms. So I started reaching out around June and July uh, to see if there are other people experiencing this and uh, whether or not healthcare uh, providers actually knew about any of this, but it wasn't known. And so I got into action and started speaking out about this. Uh, and it actually took a long time for, for things to get started in terms of advocacy. Uh, but luckily now, um, since the beginning of this year, uh, we have a work group in the Netherlands. It's the Long COVID Netherlands PASC. 
and and we started a petition that we just two weeks ago uh, got to present to the full uh, government and finally long COVID is also acknowledged so mm -hmm. a lot has uh, happened in the last one and a half years so. excellent yeah and i don't i noticed your english is considerably better than my dutch as well so Th thank you for that very clear message. So, um, Andine, maybe if we start with you, if you don't mind, if you go back to the last day you remember in be being in perfect health, and then when was the first day you kind of noticed something was wrong? What do you remember about that? And what, what was the sort of the longitudinal process after that? Andine, um, Andine first, please. Okay, so I, um, it was about, I think it was March the 27th, mm. and I remember I went out and jumped on my bike, and I thought that I, I didn't really quite have the strength that um, I normally had on my bike, so I felt a little bit um, fatigued for some strange reason, but it was quite mild, mm. um, and I, I remember I went into a fishmonger, and I was quite anxious at the fact that this guy wasn't wearing a mask, and I was quite close to him, and I felt quite worried, because at the time, um, we were in lockdown, I think. We just, were just going into lockdown, and there were, we didn't even know how many cases there were in the UK. And uh, it, was a, it was a very, very worrying time because it was a novel disease, and we knew so little about it. And I really didn't, I, I'd really been careful, I thought I'd been very careful to protect myself. And that evening, I felt okay, and then suddenly, quite late, I was suddenly hit by this wall of, of fatigue, out of the blue. Like, oh, I think I really need to go to bed. And I also got other symptoms. I became very cold and shivery, and I felt very flushed. And I felt very anxious as well. Mm. And I probably should have taken my temperature, but I, I just didn't. I just got into bed. Mm. And I remember waking in the night and, and wondering if I had a fever. I'm not sure that I did. And in the morning, I, I didn't feel terrible. And I thought, maybe this is, is some kind of an anxiety attack because of the, the situation in that mm. shop. But, and so I got up and got dressed, and then during the day, suddenly it all came back, and it, it was like that for the first few days, and that I would feel okay, and then I would feel terrible. And so one minute I could be talking to someone, the next minute I had to go and get back into bed again. I'm very, I feel, I consider myself fortunate, I didn't get the very nasty respiratory symptoms. I had some gastroenterological symptoms. Um, and I had, um, I have since developed some vascular stuff like the COVID toes and so on. Mm. But it was mainly a fatigue, but it's not just being tired. It's this overwhelming fatigue that knocks you for six. And that can be brought on by just talking to somebody. So I could have a conversation with someone for a half an hour and that would just wipe me out for the rest of the day. Um, but after about five days, I, I decided that I was feeling much better and I was going to go for a little bike ride because I thought, well, this probably wasn't COVID, you know, I, I didn't have the high temperature and persistent cough. And I went off on my bike intending to just do a 20 minute run around and I was enjoying myself so much that I did a two hour bike ride around London. And when I got back, <laughs> it was really flawed again and the next day. And it, it was like that. So I would feel that I was getting better assume I was better, let's get back to normal activity, and then it would come back. And, and I remember thinking, well, this time I'm going to wait three days before yeah. I do anything. Yeah, After three days, I'll know that I'm well again, and, and it, that didn't work either. So it was um, a sort of relaxing and remitting situation. And of course, as uh, Vicky mentioned, we knew so little about this, and we didn't know about long COVID. And despite the fact that there were post uh, the post-viral sequelae from SARS, which were mm. quite lengthy and, and quite severe, um, we weren't, mm. we don't seem to have been prepared for this. <laughs> and there certainly wasn't any, well, there was <laughs> no warning <laughs> public messaging, but there, <laughs> there still isn't that much public messaging no. about long COVID, unfortunately. Yes. Um, and in the end, I joined a support group because I thought, Did I, is this, what's going on? I didn't understand it. It didn't seem to be COVID in terms of the symptoms, well, what, what, why is it coming back the whole time? Yeah. And that's when I joined a support group, the Body Politic uh, COVID-19 support group, and there I met all these people who were going through worse and similar, and who were in many cases very young, and having some really uh, nasty symptoms and completely unable to get any help. And that's why eventually a group of us got together and decided we had to take some action, we had to get this out there, we had to get the um, this condition recognized, accepted, acknowledged, and then we added research and rehabilitation. 
Well, I saw you not that long there, uh, Vicky, quite a bit. I mean, I, I assume there's commonalities in the experience you had back in March 2020 as well, were a similar experience to Ondine. Would you like to tell us how you first became aware there was something wrong? Yeah, my, my experience is very, very similar to Ondine's, especially in, in the first couple of days, I think. Um, I, it, it was similar in the sense that I knew that there was something odd about how I was feeling. I, I mostly had, like, red patches and hot patches in my face mm -hmm. uh, that I couldn't really explain and I felt a little bit feverish but I didn't have a fever and uh, this was even before the first patient was confirmed so COVID was not even like on, on my radar that much I, I knew that was happening in, in China and, and in Italy already but as the first patient wasn't confirmed I was fully convinced that once that was the case we would hear about it and, and mm -hmm. quickly um, and so therefore, in the first couple of days, it, it didn't dawn on me that it, it could be COVID. But we had a family birthday uh, that I still went to. And that was probably uh, uh, the worst mistake uh, that I could have made in that, um, at that time. Uh, but quickly after those uh, mild uh, strange symptoms turned into a real fever. Uh, so I've been on the couch with, with the fever for about two weeks. Um, I developed pneumonia, um, and aside from that, and this is a, a symptom that is uh, not, not that much talked about, uh, but I developed a rash all over my upper body, and that started off as, it, it looked like shingles, uh, mm. but it couldn't really be explained by my GP. Um, they kind of had to do a diagnosis based on WhatsApp, uh, on photos I had to send through WhatsApp, because I couldn't get into the, come into the GP office, uh, but I couldn't really... Um, yeah, they couldn't diagnose it, and so they didn't know how to treat it or what type of medicine to give me. Uh, and eventually, they gave me an antibiotic that you cannot really prescribe to someone that has anything um, viral. So it made it worse. And, and really, for the first three months, I've had this rash uh, become worse and then less than, but it kept coming back. And I still have it to this day. Um, so it, I guess this is really depends on uh, on yeah, what part of the body the virus uh, affects. Uh, it's different in everyone. And of course, the long-term symptoms um, after after um, two months, uh, I think for me, um, also my heart became affected. So I was having palpitations um, and um, I kind of felt like my heart was skipping beats. And I tried to, to get an ECG, but it was really difficult to get into a hospital uh, because hospitals were, were overflowing as well. Uh, so that was really the the first couple of weeks. Um, that's kind of pre long COVID still, because those symptoms are different uh, different from these as well. Yeah, dear me. So so, Undine, you had a remarkably unpleasant acute phase, but just lasting for five days. Where, whereas Vicky, your acute illness was actually quite a bit longer. Yeah. And you got the severe, uh, you got the more, more severe pneumonia as, as well. Were, were you having breathing difficulties, Vicky, at the time? I did. It was mostly for the first two weeks. Um, mm. And it was breathing difficulties because of the pneumonia, but also just because I was so stuffed. So mm. I, I had to wake up uh, during the night and sit up because I felt like I was like, yeah, kind of choking on, on like everything. Um, sure. Not, not a nice picture, but um, that kind of gives you an idea of, of how bad it was um, because I, I yeah, sometimes it felt like I, I wouldn't make it through the night. I mean, I've heard so many people say that, that they felt that they were going to die and, and, and they felt that all the way through during, during their experience of long COVID as well. Because for some people, yeah. their long COVID symptoms are, are, are bad enough to make them feel that uh, they're not going to make it. And I think the anxiety probably is part of it, isn't it? You know, it's almost, you know, you, you, you would be anxious to a degree because you're ill, and that's an anxiety-provoking situation, but it almost seems that the anxiety is almost one of the symptoms, as if it's the, the long COVID or the COVID affecting the mind somehow. Does that, do, do you think that's true? There's like a disproportionate anxiety. Ondine, did you find that? Um, I think, well, I'm not, I'm not going on my own experience, but there's certainly um, cognitive and neurological effects of the virus mm -hmm. and the and long COVID. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that both acute COVID and long COVID 
has um, impact on uh, the neurological system and the brain. And I think there are um, there is a problem in that it's these some of the symptoms could be similar to symptoms that people have when they're anxious, and this yes. has caused a lot of people to be um, diagnosed with anxiety when they were presenting with long COVID symptoms, mm. yeah. which was very problematic because it meant they couldn't get any care. Yeah. And of course, there are people who who have literally had to fight for months to get themselves heard and to be listened to by the by the doctors mm. um, and not be dismissed. And people were dismissed. For, for long periods, and that in itself is a is a kind of a trauma, yes. which is not going to help your recovery. Yes. Um, but I think it's it's um, I think it's important to to differentiate between neurological symptoms um, and and pure anxiety caused yes. by the fact that you're ill. Yes. Um, I think that many would argue that. Um, uh, Depressive illness is caused by physical changes yes. anyway, but um, and, and we've but and we've certainly seen physical changes in people's brains, even people who've recovered from COVID. That yes. was the Biobank study. Yes. Um, but uh, yes, of course, having these ongoing symptoms for months and months, knowing that there is no cure, mm. being presented with doctors who shrug in the early days or in even re even now saying well you know we can try this try breathing exercises try try there's no there's no real um, pathway in a way because there's no there's no treatment that is not going to um, result in people um, uh, having a carefree attitude towards their illness because you're not the illness isn't being managed and of course that does increase anxiety but I think it there is too much of a, of a um, People, are, doctors, are, doctors, and me other medical workers are, are too ready mm. to diagnose people with anxiety and panic attacks. And I know that's happened to somebody I know um, very recently, whose daughter has was was very sick, and um, they've been been told that it's a panic attack mm. and that they seem anxious when there's clearly something going on, mm. or clearly something worrying. And and this has been a bit of a battle for anybody advocating for long COVID or suffering from long COVID is to actually get over that mm -hmm. so that your, your physical symptoms are taken seriously. And we do know that because of, of all the studies with scanning, um, scans and imaging to show that there are, there are physical manifestations, it's caused by, by something going on which is tangible um, and, and blood tests as well showing mm -hmm. uh, increased autoantibodies and cytokines and so on. Mm. I'm really glad you brought that point up actually because the most fundamental mistake you can make in this thing is to attribute something to a psychological cause when it has an organic basis and from the clinical features we've been learning about i mean there is no debate this is an organic illness the same as a, a bacterial infection or the same as appendicitis or the, the, the same the same as any other other physical illness i mean but what about you you Vicky? How, how bad was your sort of what you might call sort of psychological distress in the early stages I think the psychological distress um, is not necessarily due to the virus itself, um, but of course you go through a lot of anxiety when you know you know that you need care. Yeah. In my case, I, I had double pneumonia and I, I couldn't even walk and, and still I couldn't get to a hospital. I, I literally called the hospital multiple times and they told me, just call back when you cannot breathe anymore when you cannot speak one sentence uh, without uh, grasping for air. And, and, and that, that is a thing that, that'll make you anxious, all right? Um, and aside from that, just, just one thing I, I'd like to uh, mention. Please. That um, throughout the, uh, when I got sick myself, um, I also lost my dad. Uh, that was when I was in quarantine. And, um, he had been sick for a long time, but that, of course, is a very distressing situation. Um, and it was, um, someone asked me, how was your initial disease? Uh, the first first time I got into a GP office and actually was able to come in. And they put that in my medical dossier. But ever since, every single appointment I've had, um, it doesn't matter which type of symptom I came in for, they started up every every single appointment with, oh, I see that you recently lost your dad.
студия телеканала Россия Вести, в студии Рис Плончаков. И главное к этому часу. Спасательная операция в Самарской области. Десятки автомобилей оказались в снежной ловушке. Ночная пурга завела трассы в Татарстане. В Альметьевске сдуло новогодние украшения. В Томске второй за неделю пожар в супермаркетах. Основная версия поджог. Рождественские каникулы в Европе с новой волной коронавирусной инфекции. Российская обсерватория «Спектр», которая состречает космический телескоп «Джеймс Уэбб», мир на пороге эры невероятных открытий в астрономии. Масштабный новогодний карнавал, десятки делов морозов и снегурочек прошли по улицам Екатеринбурга. И чем уделит туристов новогодняя столица России, Нижний Новгород? Сильные метели хозяйничают в Поволжье и на Урале. На федеральной трассе М5 почти нулевая. На месте затора. По предварительной информации, на месте затора находится около 20 автомобилей. Ленинин с Новым годом. Отмечено также, что в будущем году Каир примет участие в Петербургском экономическом форуме. Несмотря на некоторые улучшения ситуации с ковидом в России, регионы продолжают усиливать меры безопасности, чтобы не допустить новой вспышки. В Самаре увеличили количество ежедневных рейдов в общественном транспорте. Контролируют соблюдение масочного режима. Только за несколько дней составлено более 60 десятков протоколов. В Ханты-Мансийском автономном округе сотрудников магазинов обязали предъявлять покупателям по требованию электронные сертификаты о вакцинации. При этом большая часть работников сферы торговли в регионе уже сделали прививку или переболели. В Красноярске свое ноу-хау по улицам города теперь ежедневно передвигается специальный вакциномобиль. Всего же прививку так это страшно, как -то, да, это, и сделали уже более 56% жителей репортажа Александра Черкашина. Здоровый пациент, покидающий красную зону, самая большая награда для врачей. В этом госпитале она двойная. Елена попала на больничную койку на 21-й неделе беременности. Температура была высокая, 38,5. С каждым днем было все хуже и хуже. И через 5 я уже более или менее стала восстанавливаться. Сейчас Елене предстоит пройти углубленную диспансеризацию. У нее сильная отдышка, но самое тяжелое позади. Татьяна попала на 29-й неделе. Рожать пришлось прямо в госпитале. Рада, что он живой просто. Спасибо гинекологу, что вовремя среагировали это все. У Татьяны родился мальчик, а теперь она наконец может его увидеть. Тест у обоих отрицательный. В этот госпиталь попадают только беременные. И по словам врачей, никто из будущих матерей не защищал себя вакциной. Ну, поскольку мы боремся от ситуации жизни или смерти, то мы принимаем как бы, все возможные усилия для спасения как ребенка, так и матери. Хотя, по данным ученых, вакцинация беременным рекомендована даже на поздних сроках. Коронавирус может спровоцировать задержку развития плода или увеличить вероятность прерывания беременности. Власти края делают все возможное, чтобы вакцина была максимально доступной. В новых микрорайонах Красноярска наподобие этого всего одна поликлиника. Очереди за вакциной неизбежны, поэтому в помощь сюда приехал вакциномобиль. Это второй такой пункт, который курсирует по Красноярску. Внутри полноценный прививочный кабинет. С собой нужно взять только паспорт и медицинский полис. А сама процедура длится не дольше 10 минут. Еще нет очереди. Очень мобильно, очень быстро и очень функционально. Рекомендую. По данным Краевого Министерства здравоохранения, вакцинацию уже прошли 56% жителей края. И праздники не повод прерывать иммунизацию населения. Внебольничные пункты вакцинации будут открыты и в предстоящие новогодние каникулы. Александр Черкашин, Александр Сатенко, Сергей Ларионов и Елена Галеева. Вести, Красноярский край. Уголовное дело возбудили в Томске по факту второго за неделю поджога в городском супермаркете. Накануне в одном из магазинов загорелся отдел, где находились новогодние фейерверки и петарды. Они тут же начали взрываться и разлетаться по всему помещению. Посетителей и сотрудников всего 650 человек эвакуировали. Пожар удалось оперативно локализовать и потушить. Пострадавших нет. По записям с видеокамер удалось установить подозреваемого в поджоге. Им оказался сотрудник этого же магазина. Он задержан. Напомню, 21 декабря в Томске подожгли другой супермаркет. Тогда здание полностью сгорело. 
Этим утром в улан энергетики начали подключать к горячему водоснабжению жилые дома и социальные объекты. Восстановительные работы после аварии на ТЭЦ завершаются. Сегодня горячая вода вернется в 55 детских садов и поликлиник, а также в более чем 300 жилых домов. Режим ЧС, который действовал в городе трое суток, сняли. Репортаж Алексей Колыбов. Главная новость для жителей столицы Бурятии в это воскресенье, то, что в домах наконец тепло. Сейчас на ТЭЦ-1 работают над подачей людям горячей воды. Районы, попавшие в зону ограничения подачи тепла и горячей воды, подключают поочередно. Сейчас в трубах теплопровода температура воды больше 100 градусов. Батареи горячие, даже окна запотели. Объекты социального значения включают тоже поэтапно, чтобы избежать аварии на линиях. Тепло и горячая вода восстановлена в больницах, поликлиниках и детских садах. Есть тепло, температура в коридоре тоже Прилично 24 градуса. На ТЭЦ-1 восстановили и запустили в работу 5 из 7 котлов. Многоквартирные дома горячей воде подключают сотнями. Пока ситуацию полностью не стабилизировали, в городе работает горячая линия. Ну, конечно, в данный момент люди нам обращаются за помощью. В большей мере это психологический момент, то есть успокаиваем. На который... Куда теперь сбираются вещи? Из русской зимы в весеннем. Анатолий... Hi there, welcome to Dundee Piano. Today we're going to have a, a listen to some music and see how we can tell what kind of music it is. What gives the music its character, what musical features you can hear in the music. I'm going to work from the ABISM grade 5 example okay, in this book. And we'll just cover some of the kind of obvious things you can listen for when you're you're listening for a style of music, okay, or a period of music. So here's an example here. Etc. yeah. Hopefully you can hear right away, it's major key, major key, it's loud, it's bright, it has a counterpoint going on. That's the first thing that jumps out. Etc. Yeah, and um, that should be the first clue that is baroque. Okay, it just sounds baroque before you listen to any of the rest of it. Okay. Also, it has a couple of little mordants in there. I didn't really manage them very well, but. So it has a couple of little um, ornaments like mordants mm -hmm. and mini trills. But I think it's baroque just by the, the steady pace, the steady volume, the lack of dynamics, the lack of pedal. Okay? And the, as I say, the counterpoint. When you can hear one melody in one hand being echoed in the other. That's a giveaway that's baroque. Okay, it's definitely not 20th century. It is not classical because it doesn't have enough of the classical kind of themes going on. Okay. Right, here's another example, it's a bit slower. Let's see how we do with this one.
just any pace but pedal, I don't know if you're about pedal that much. Um, a lot of chromatic movements in the notes and the harmonies and the melodies, some ornaments in there, and some kind of, kind of progressions like that, which kind of give the game away. It's definitely not Baroque, it's definitely not classical. He's moving towards Romantic or 20th century. How can you tell the difference? Okay. Um, I guess the key is when you hear a piece like that, it's starting to sound more modern, yeah? It's sounding a bit more 20th century in that area there. And also, you know, it's, it's to the 20th century end of Romantic. It's, it's, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's not a, a kind of older romantic kind of piece. Mm -hmm. It has harmonies like that, which are kind of slightly atonal, but not quite. You know, they're verging on atonal. Mm -hmm. It has kind of chromatic shifts. Okay, so 20th century, that's what tells you. Mm -hmm. you know? um, just for reference, a look at their official notes. Jazzy style, <coughs> okay. Crush notes and flexible rhythms, right? So it's quite easy going. It doesn't, it doesn't have a steady pace in there that was pushed towards classical or romantic. Right, anyway, let's have another example here. What have we got? Andante. <laughs> classical or romantic. The pedal again is probably pushing you away from classical, okay, and you're moving up to romantic with that pedal. It's not modern enough to be 20th century. And it's too kind of harmonious, or not harmonious, that's the wrong word. It's too kind of song-like to be classical, I think. And it's too fluid in the rhythms. Pushes it away from classical, which would be a more structured um, piece of music. See if I can find a classical one, for example. You know, there you go. That's a bit more classical, okay? Rigid, steady, structured harmonies, progressions. You know, everything moves straight through. There's no. There's probably no pedal. I probably used a bit of pedal playing it, but. So again, you're in a classical romantic area. No pedal, less likely to be romantic. Mm -hmm. 
no variation of tempo in that mm -hmm. section there. There is a right at the end actually, so I mean there's a little variation in tempo, but generally it's quite a well structured classical example. Mm -hmm. That one, okay. Um, so hopefully you're getting the idea, right? You have four four styles of grade five to listen for. Baroque. Is it like a harpsichord? Is there very little variation of dynamic? Okay, there's no pedal. It sounds like there's counterpoint. There's different tunes going on the right and the left, or maybe the same tune twice in the echoes. Okay, are there ornaments like mordants and trills, such? Well, probably mordants. So there's your baroque. Classical. Is there a strong theme that gets repeated at different volumes? Are there strong chordal progressions where things are quite logical sounding? Mm -hmm. Very little variation of tempo. Okay, is that classical? Mm -hmm. Romantic, are we using the pedal more? Mm -hmm. Are you using different types of chords more? Mm -hmm. Are you moving beyond the strict major mm -hmm. one, four, five, or whatever, mm -hmm. one, two, six, whatever mm -hmm. progressions? Mm -hmm. Are you moving away from those other typical classical progressions? Are you more fluid in your tempo, rubato? Are you stealing notes and rhythms? And then finally, 20th century, are you becoming more towards the atonal kind of kind of moving around on semitones more often? Again, using ornaments like the other periods, but maybe in different ways. The rhythm may not be very consistent in the 20th century example they give you. So you're pushing away from the other periods in your 20th century examples. So yeah, when you listen to music, listen out for some of those key aspects. I'll play one, another one here. See what you think of this one. Oh, see if I can play it. Okay, it's like. You're already thinking 20th century, okay? But you don't think it looks at any further than that. How about this one? song-like and you have a little bit of a trill in there and it's progression is a bit more than classical yeah so we're into the romantic and then finally <laughs> classical it just sounds classical right away it's got a fairly Structured, chord based, almost arpeggio. Didn't mention arpeggios before, but yeah, they often appear in classical examples. Ba -ba 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 Yeah, well, variation of volume there, and kind of showing off on scales and arpeggios. So that's a classical example. So, hopefully, those examples will give you something to think about, things to listen for and how to tell the difference between some of the periods of music you get asked about. Okay, thanks for watching.
My job is to make college easier because students have a lot of fun. Sorry, coach. Plays. Like Harper, an econ major who piles on the pressure. Grammarly can help her stress less. This term paper has got to be great. It's a third of my grade. Your ideas are on the money. Let's make sure they come across clearly with grammar. Watch it work. Watch it work. Wow, that is strong. <laughs> and Avery, an engineering major who runs on ambition and coffee. Grammarly can get her her dream job. My application needs to stand out. They only meet with the top... So, Kirsty, I'm going to play a piece twice. Listen, then tell me the time signature and about the dynamics and articulation. four beats in a bar. Um, and I think that the melody was quite legato and although the bass wasn't and dynamics. The first phrase was quite forte but then the second phrase was quite primal with a crescendo. Thank you. I'm going to play the piece twice more, listen, and then tell me about two other characteristics of the piece. singing style and my second point is that the melody wasn't in the bass and the bass was just simple chords which added to the melody. Now listen to the first four bars of the piece and then tell me into which key the music modulates. It starts in the key of A major and here is the key chord. twice more with two changes in the melody line. The changes may be to the pitch or the rhythm or both. Tell me or show me in which bars the changes happened and what they were.
rhythmic change in verse 3, and a change in pitch in verse 5. Да нет, ты что, тут столько снега выпало, вообще все рейсы отменили, и на самом деле еще работа.
you say about the use of texture in this piece? What can you say about the structure of this piece? What in the music gives this piece its character? And finally, what can you say about the style and the period? Describe 